Uh, I guess we'll get this going again. Um, hope you guys are enjoying everything so far. Yep. Yeah. Can we do it again next year? Woo! Yeah. Yeah. Can you bring friends with you next year? Bring more people? Do I need a bigger room next year? Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right, all right. So next up is, uh, excuse me? In Halloween costume. No. Well, there is a costume party tonight. I made a costume already. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can even touch that. Yeah. Uh, so next up is uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Adrian Crenshaw. You guys should all, all know him, better known as uh, the Iron Geek. IronGeek.com. Let's hear it for Adrian. Uh, Adrian. <laughs> So that's my pro bono uh, PDP. 
attackers, of course, would be interested. And anybody who's actually developing or just has to look at IDS logs or uh, just general logs might be interested in the kind of things they should look for that could lead to the identifying of uh, someone who's attacking the systems. And of course, instant response people and people who want to test instant response. Actually, I don't do pen testing professionally, but how often as a pen tester are you asked to, I want you to test our instant response team and how good they are at tracking down data based on attack and actually leave some stuff that they should be able to track down. Does anybody get asked to do a pen test like that? Yeah. I've, the people like that I think might be interested in this talk and people who want to uh, <laughs> look better at when they do their instant response uh, might be interested. Uh, a lot of the tips I'm going to give throughout this entire talk can largely be solved by just building a clean moon box. It's essentially a box you do nothing else with but run the attack tools. It has no other personal data on it. Uh, make a clean box if you can afford it, have your own separate laptop completely. You know, a separate boot partition might be the second best option. Push comes to shove, you can try making a VM, although you still have your normal uh, host OS computer on that network, which is not an ideal solution. And uh, most of these mitigation techniques I'm going to be talking about throughout this talk are, uh, can be taken in, inside the clean room box. But I'm also going to be offering them separate tips as well. <coughs> also, for legitimate pen testers, and I've seen uh, Ed's code make a big deal about this one, it keeps customer data separate. Because imagine, I've heard, heard tales, I think it was um, Chris Nickerson on the podcast once. He was um, talking about doing a pen test where he actually was in scope, he was scanning all the machines on the network, and he happened to find another machine that was like running Metasploit or something, and he found out it was another pen test's box and all his customers' data on it. Now, that's one thing that's bad. But imagine if that pen tester actually had data from other companies as well as the company he was currently assigned on. That really does not look good to the company, now does it? All right, just a few links of many that could be discussed. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list. Uh, MAC addresses left in log files. Browser tabs that automatically open. Network scans that automatically use the credentials of the logged in user. Uh, Wi-Fi SID probes. Host name slash NetBIOS name broadcasts and uh, last DHCP lease renews, and various other apps, like well, not so much Skype, but definitely IRC and some IM clients. All right, all these things can help lead to the identity of someone who's attacking the network if you happen to come across these in the logs. First of all, most of us probably know what a MAC address is, and the first six, my well, yeah, here, anyway, here's me pulling up the ifconfig command in Linux, or the ipconfig command slash all in Windows, and I've highlighted the MAC address in question. Now, in theory, every MAC address is unique. <coughs> this ain't true. And, oh man, I hate when I'm asking on a forum system or some kind of like hard block and I get some of the Best Buy workers knowledge of networking and I say, well, your MAC address is unique, you can't change it. Bullshit. Uh, but more or less they're unique, at least the ones that are burnt on the card should be unique, barring certain manufacturer screw-ups. Uh, they can be spoofed fairly easily, but uh, if you're an actual attacker, I suppose good luck proving that if they happen to find your MAC address on a machine. If they happen to come confiscate your machine and find out its MAC address is matches something that's in the logs. Um, the first six he hex digits are the OUI, or Organizational Unit Identifier. There's actually a nice little web page out there you can look it up. So if you see the first six MAC, plus the uh, first six hex decimal characters that, you can find out who the original vendor of that particular network product was. Assuming the person didn't spoof the MAC address, which I'll discuss here in a second. Also, I'm kind of wondering about this. Um, I wonder how many vendors actually log this information. Like, let's say you're a company. Um, I'm just going to scream. Let's say you're Tenacity Solutions. <laughs> and, and, and you buy something, but you buy a laptop from Dell. I mean, we know they know that your uh, tracking information as far as your, your service tag and all that. I wonder if that data is actually logged. When, they, uh, when you buy a PC from Dell or some other company. And I wonder if the right people like subpoena them for information, if they would have that. I mean, it wouldn't be hard for them to make it, to do that. And I'm just curious, I never heard of them doing that. And also, uh, Dr. Huna, you were talking about some kind of service that actually ties uh, MAC addresses to, um, yeah, to where someone is in the world Google's based on geolocation. Some, Google's got a geolocation code where you can go in and put a MAC address and if it's using public Wi-Fi and a location is turned on, 
it will actually show you where it was. I want to see that script. That's going to be really useful. Because especially from the standpoint of not if you're attacking somewhere, or you want to find an attack, and you happen to find a MAC address log, you can use that service to go, oh, this is probably that likely person's home. That's, uh, <coughs> that'd be a bad thing. So if you find that script, mail it to me. Okay, mitigations against this particular data leak problem. You can change it if possible. Uh, there's a guide out there on my website like a ton of different ways of uh, changing MAC addresses on OS X, various versions of Windows, uh, Linux, uh, BSD, just a ton of different operating systems. You have been doing it in Linux. It's really simple. ifconfig, name of the interface, down, hardware, ether, and whatever ethernet address you want to set up, then bring it back up. And now you have a new MAC address. Super simple in Linux. Windows is a little more complicated. There's actually a bunch of reg hacks you have to make. And for some reason, on some network cards, it just doesn't work. Like the wireless card in my uh, current laptop, I can't do it to. I can't change it. I've seen other network cards where you can change it, but only if you keep the, the six-digit uh, OUI the same. And my Ethernet card, though, no problems. I can change that MAC address to anything I want on my machine. So it seems to be somewhat either driver or hardware dependent. But another tool of Mad Max fails for you. There's also SMAC. Mad Max is a tool I uh, wrote, and that's a kind of designed part of the idea around someone else's script, but it randomizes the MAC address, or can randomize the MAC address, and your host name every time you reboot the machine. All right, a related subject matter is IP6. IP6, at least for a uh, local link IP address, actually clones your MAC address into it, so to speak. For instance, if you notice, uh, this is my my local link address, this is my MAC address, and you see how this is formed out of my MAC address. And there's a certain digit up here that's actually flipped to keep things from um, coming out at 0, 0 in different parts of the IP6 address. I need to do more research on this, because I've seen people talk about this with building your identity, but on the other hand, I've seen this local link address, it's only supposed to be used on the local area network. So, if you're on the local area network, the MAC address is already pretty much given out there anyway, because it has to be for ARP to work properly. So if anybody has some more details on IP6 and how far, at which particular IP6 addresses of all the different IP6 addresses your machine has, which ones uh, actually have your MAC address into the fig, add your MAC address into the figuring of the address, let me know. That was a whole lot of saying the word address. All right, next possible thing that uh, can lead to identity. Imagine someone's at the local coffee shop and has a like, scan the network, but they're also web surfing around and they open up a bunch of tabs. How much information, well, you already know what IP address is doing the scanning of any kind of logging at all. And if you have some kind of um, a web analysis tool, what web pages people are going to, if the same IP is visiting all these different sites, it might give you a rough idea of who they are. First of all, if you're visiting imgeek.com, that might give you a rough idea that it's either somewhat me or someone imposing me. <laughs> at least in my local area. Uh, if it's, but let's say it's a site that gets a little less traffic. If it's if someone's personal blog, that'll give you a fair amount of information. You already know the person's a Google user. I suppose if you knew the right people, you could ask Google who logged in from this IP address. The grand if it's behind that, it's going to be one big IP address. At a certain time, that would definitely lower the anonymity set. You know I'm a uh, Gmail user. Uh, there's various other things I could have up there. Not to mention you have tabs that automatically open up to uh, services that are not encrypted whatsoever. You can uh, possibly extract usernames. For instance, let's say I had a form system come up automatically in one of my tabs. Well, if you scrape the content that I requested, then it was delivered to me, you can probably pull out my username for that form system. A little bit of Googling later, you have the identity of the person. Or if not the absolute identity, some clues to point you in the right general direction. See, just having the name of a site can give you a ton of information about the person, what they're interested in, where they're going to visit, and if you only know some of the likely suspects, this might help narrow it down. Um, plain text login information. Obviously, if the person automatically logs in as soon as they open the tab, and that's done in plain text like the bar form systems do, you can see the other person's username and password, and a lot of people that use the same username on multiple systems, and then a little Google stalking later, uh, you can figure out who they are. I'm um, related something to that. At one time, I was like the number one Google hit for how to cyber stalk. I wonder exactly how do you put that in your resume. Actually, that was one on uh, cyber stalking, an article on cyber stalking potential employers. So not quite as diabolical as it sounds. Uh, 
Um, once again, like I mentioned, you know, various plain text that might be passed along on the webpage. Like if you're visiting Facebook and they extract all sorts of information about who you are and who your friends are. Um, even if SSL is used, DNS queries can give a fair amount of information. First of all, if SSL is used, you've still got it, a connection to that box that tell you who you're communicating with. But let's say that they're even using some kind of a proxy that doesn't necessarily for the DNS request through the proxy. DNS links, as it's known in, um, in the Tor community. Just having that, you have a fair amount of information about who the person is. And of course, headers give you a ton of information like browser type, uh, version, what plugins the person is running, all these kind of details. That gets a lot more interesting when you start talking about um, not being on the same local area network as the attacker. And uh, th let's say they're attacking your website instead and you don't have any information on the uh, local LAN side of the data. All right, mitigation for this. Obviously, having a dedicated browser for certain activities would go a long way so you don't automatically pass certain credentials. Like, I'm always worried when I open up a, even though I'm not logging into a site, if I go to a coffee shop and I log, and I bring up a machine, and I have all my tabs automatically open it, and I had chose to store cookies, it's passing those cookies across the network. And if it's not using any kind of SSL, or even if it's using SSL in certain weak implementations, someone can extract that out. So having it do anything I don't want it to do, automatically can be a very bad call, especially when you're at DEF CON. I was like, okay, uh, did I remove all my tabs? Did I clean all my data and make sure no cookies are going to be passed on this network? Uh, limiting plugins can help somewhat to uh, lessen your, um, how specific they can get about who you are, at least as far as your user agent is concerned. Also, there's various ways with JavaScript to uh, pull stuff out of uh, the browser and figure out what plugin someone has installed. You can keep changing a user agent, but really, I think the best thing to do is just keep it fairly generic. I know on the I2P darknet, they just have a common one that the I2P software automatically sets everybody's to be. So you're anonymous by the virtue of everybody being the same. Uh, also, of course, don't have the browser do anything automatically for you. Open tabs, passwords, forms, any of that kind of stuff. Because you just don't want any data being passed in the network that you don't intend to be passed out there. That goes back to that whole, the quieter you are, the more you can hear. Another uh, common way that people leak data out is uh, network scans that automatically use the credentials uh, of whoever's logged into the box. Who has ever seen the tool NetScan? Okay. How about MBT scan? All right. Very similar tools in that particular spec. I like NetScan so from the standpoint of you can scan a whole bunch of IPs really, really quickly, and it quickly tells you whether or not you have a read-write rights to any kind of SMB file shares on that box. Uh, it's awesome, or so Bob tells me, to go to a coffee shop and do a scan like this and see what kind of stuff's open. For instance, on this particular scan, you'll notice there's a machine called Ava, and uh, it has two folders that we have only read access to, movies and MP3s, uh, three that are locked down to the admin, various admin shares, and one that we have read and write rights to called English. But uh, yeah, NetScan is a really cool tool, but if not used properly, it leaves information all over the logs. Now, first of all, all everything has to be turned off, and in most cases, a lot of people leave this stuff off and they really shouldn't necessarily. In this case, I've gone to this particular machine, turned on auditing for both success and failure. You can do this under the local security policy manager, or via GPO remotely. Uh, also, it matters how the person's logging into the box. If you're in a domain, you're going to have classics which start automatically. The other option is guest only. And which one of those it is will depend on what is thrown into the logs. The whole guest only thing kind of annoys me. And the way that Windows 7 automatically starts to share things depending on where you say you are. I hate the idea of keeping automatic because it makes it a little bit more confusing on what exactly you configured something to do. But um, how does this set the log? How, how does this set the log in also makes a difference. If you have, don't have it on classic, it's going to try guest login only, so you won't be prompted for a username and password. Um, but here's a few examples of what things might look like in the logs. The uh, two items in the back are uh, Windows XP. The one on the left is where basically I had guest only uh, access turned on. And even though I was using the Adrian account, it logged guest as my username. If I hadn't covered up the other screenshot in the far right, it would say Adrian because I turned on classic mode. And uh, that one in the very front, 
that's uh, the Windows 7 log of the same basic kind of event. Uh, notice uh, air, event IDs and all that's changed, just like Carlos was mentioning earlier. And uh, you see that it logged the name Adrian. Well, if you find someone tried to log into your machine remotely, and it was doing the scanning time network, and you looked in your logs, and you saw it was Adrian, and you happen to know I frequent your coffee shop, how long would it take you to figure out who it is that's actually doing this network scanning? Probably not a whole lot of time. All right, mitigation for this. Obviously, first off, use a different account. Uh, you can also choose just to use a non-specific username. Administrator might possibly work. Uh, if the tool has an option to uh, use other credentials, try it out. I tried this once with Network Miner, and because it has this option, and as I recall, it still passed my credentials. So it's like the old Ron Reagan saying. Uh, I'm pretty sure someone said it for him also. But trust but verify. You can try that out, but you know, put a sniff on it. Actually, run it against many machines and look at the logs and see what it actually plucks in there. And of course, shift, right click, run as. You really got to do more shoot work in one account. You can just do a quick, you know, hold down shift, right click, run as, and run it as some other account. Related ideas. When sometimes auditing can cause problems. Sometimes actually auditing, depending on how it's done, uh, can actually cause security problems. Who here has ever accidentally fat fingered the login and typed in the um, password on the username field? I know there's more people out there that's done that, yeah. Well, Linux does this more or less correctly because it doesn't automatically put in the name of the failed login. Windows does uh, put in the name of the failed login. So let's say my password is uh, I love sea monkeys. Well, I type that in accidentally in my username, and all of a sudden there's a password. My password is actually in the logs in plain text for anybody with administrative privileges, or anybody that wants to take a boot CD off that machine, boot it up and copy the event lock off, or anybody like uh, Carlos could uh, just attack me with a interpreter and then just start plucking out those potential credentials. So let's say that this could be a problem. So let's say Carlos pops a box. He can go searching through the entire log and go, okay, let me look for all failed logins. Okay, I'm pretty sure the usernames do not match the pattern S3AM0NK3Y. So I'm guessing that's a password. What's the very next successful login right after that? It's probably the username. And a while back, I actually um, wrote a script to do this. I called it the Pancake Attack. Problem exists between chair and keyboard. Oh, uh, keyboard and chair in this case. And I have a code out there for basically a little script that automatically looks like this. Unfortunately, I haven't updated it since Windows XP days. So it doesn't work in Vista 07, but it should be a fairly easy task to update it to make it work in newer versions. All right, another thing that leaks out um, information from someone is SID probes. And I dream about it does a lot of wireless networking nowadays. I might want some more details from you on this, because it used to be back in the day, uh, depending on what OS you were running, if, let's say you're attached to a certain uh, network, your machine at some other point later in time, if it wasn't attached to a network, may sit out there and probe for a network it's attached to previously. So let's say you're no longer at home, you're no longer at the coffee shop, you're at work, it might probe out there, hey, is this particular SID at Adrian's house? Is it out there? No. Coffee shop, um, I like coffee beans. Is it out there? No, it's not. And then finally, you may try my business work and actually connect. Well, all these different probes are easily to sniff off the, uh, out of the air if you're using uh, a network card in monitor mode. Kismet automatically puts this stuff out underneath the probe category. Now, I remember back in the day, I want to say it was XP, uh, early service packs, it would automatically do this sort of probing. I'm not sure it does that as much on newer versions of Windows. Does anybody know which ones automatically probe now and which ones don't? All right, ones that do automatically probe, though, and, um, well, for instance, ad hoc, that's automatically going to probe. And if you start seeing probes coming across that say HP something, 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 you might have a rough idea that the guy has this particular HP printer at his house. Because you've seen those kind of probes come across. Other types of ad, uh, ad hoc networks, you might see that, what, what was it? Free public Wi Fi. Free public Wi Fi. Oh, that's spread all over the freaking <laughs> world. Uh, just various things like that can be got information. Also, one of those asinine things I always hear people talk about. Like I said, this depends greatly on OS detection. Uh, I've already covered most of what I was going to say here. 
Oh, network names, of course, may be significant. By knowing the network names it's probing for, you get an idea of what the person's into, like what their favorite comic book character is, if they happen to name the home access point Wolverine, or what coffee shops they go to, because those things will pop up, what school they go to, those, those SIDs might pop up in the probes of the networks they're looking for. Uh, geolocation, by the way, do you know what SID someone's attaching to? Have you ever gone out to a Wiggle? Wiggle's basically the largest like independent database of wireless access points I know of. Go out there and put in a SID. If it's unique enough, you can look up someone's MAC address. Well, or, well, you won't have the MAC address regardless. I mean, look up the SID, you'll get a geographical location for it. You can then plug that into Google Earth and find out where that particular access point is. Assuming it's not something super common like Linksys. Uh, who all here watches Hack 5? Pretty good video podcast. Darren Kitchen was in the hospital once, and I was kind of curious what hospital he was in. And he was like uh, doing a show from the hospital, and I saw the uh, network SID on like one of his screenshots. And so I looked up what hospital he was in using this technique. By the way, yes, the slides I've been showing, if you look at my SID, you'll be able to figure out where I live too. But it's no huge secret. And I will only. Anyway. <laughs> Common mitigation things you can do. You know, use a common SID. You can be little screw of attack is name keep your SID to be as Linksys. <laughs> Just to see if it oh well, this guy get hit with Linksys. It must be wide open. See if they screw around with you. But I actually do lock it down. Uh, clean out unused wireless networks, that way you know for sure you're not gonna do uh, they're not gonna get probed for. Uh, disable auto connects. There's various uh, options you can set. Like I said, uh, New OSs I was playing around with this in, they don't seem to send these probes automatically. Uh, but if you have uh, broadcasting turned off, pretty much the person's got the automatic probe to be able to find it. A lot of people security measure recommend turning off SID broadcasting. This is such an asinine, stupid, inbred idea from a security standpoint. For one of the first of all, I've seen clients that just totally screw up if you're not broadcasting your SID. That's first of all. Second of all, it's going to control the whole, confuse the hell out of users, so there's usability issues there. Third, it doesn't make a freaking difference. If you have any association traffic, anybody who knows what they're doing is going to have a card in monitor mode and plug the SID out anyway, so there's no real security feature. But this also means that machines that have attached to it before will have to be configured to automatically connect even if it's not broadcasting, and this means any place they do go, even on a newer operating system, it's going to be going out there probing saying, hey, I'm a machine, and before I connected to this SID, this gives you information about me, how are you doing? But people still, you still see people recommend this. I actually was at a place where uh, the, the tech in charge, or this person who was helping out his friend who owned the business, was recommending stuff like, oh, yeah, WPA slows things down too much. Just use MAC address filtering. And Bob, my friend Bob tells me the same guy looks like he configured something that says hide servers. And his version of hide servers was basically just to turn off um, broadcasting of hey I'm out here messages from NetBIOS. <coughs> if you scan the IP address, you're still going to find it. Kind of, um, eh, scary. By the way, here's that particular config that I was mentioning. If you go into your uh, wireless, uh, <sighs> configure wireless connection stuff in Windows 7. By the way, anybody else find it in Windows 7? It's a good thing they improved the search functionality. Or well, I actually started with Windows Vista because they moved the control panels to such screwed up 2 billion clicks places to get to them that the only way you can possibly find those control panels is to use search. Alright, another way that uh, data gets leaked out about a machine about and uh, about who's doing what on a network is via either the host name or NetBIOS name broadcasts. In the Windows world, it's more or less, this is not what I'm saying, I can more or less equate the same thing. But based on uh, these names, what can you tell about the people connecting to this network? Well, we know one person is probably into the TV show um, Bobby's World. His name might actually be Bobby, and he's just trying to be ironic. Uh, there's a machine called uh, Glenn Lappy. We'll take a while, I guess, that's a laptop, and probably the guy who owns this Glenn. Glenn happens to be my roommate, so uh, that is the case. Uh, PC, that's someone who likes to be very nondescript, so that's one thing. Uh, IG test 20 GB, what does that say about that particular box? Just from the host name, what does that tell you about that box? 
Mm-hmm. What's that? 20 gigabyte. Uh, the IG on the front is IG. IG. And what do you, if I have a box named test, what are some other assumptions you might make as a pen tester about that box? <laughs> not locked down, possibly not hardened. So I, I can get a, a good likely target just right there. Might have client data on it. Might have client data on it. Might have um, versions of an application that haven't been hardened. Like, for instance, you're doing web application development. It's fine to leak all sorts of error messages out to the end user while you're writing it in the test environment because that's useful for debugging. Now, when you actually put that in production, you should take that crap out. But the test one may not have that type of stuff crap taken out. So when you throw your SQL attacks against that, you don't just get back an error message that says nothing. You might get back an error message with a precise SQL string, which really helps out a whole lot. A um, few more details. Now, in this particular case, this is... Um, the one previously was basically um, given to the uh, router because of a DHCP request that requested um, a particular host name. NetBIOS also broadcasts this out here. Like for instance, we have a machine right here, and I don't know if you can read that in back there, but it was sending out messages saying, hey, I'm out here, how y'all doing? Hey, I'm out here, how y'all doing? And this is the machine name, Skynet. Well, if you saw a machine named Skynet, what can you assume about the owner? They like Terminator. Right. If you're going to try a few passwords or start constructing a password dictionary to attack this machine, what are you going to do? Terminator. <laughs> some of the... Oh, <laughs> some of the... <sighs> anyway. DHCP can also have the host option, and that's basically what you saw on that first screen of uh, a picture of the, my router's um, entry page. Uh, net files and things rather than saying, hey, I'm out here, it's another example. Direct probes may sometimes return uh, what the machine's name is. Mitigation, you can choose a less specific name or a default manufacturer's name if known. Uh, <coughs> if you don't want to confuse someone, you have a Dell laptop, find out what HP is you know, calling their machines. What is it? Like, well, I think Toshiba puts like Toshiba-owner as like the default machine name or something along those lines. Um, disabled NetBIOS, I'm not sure how well this is going to work as far as naming. I'm not sure how reliable things are necessarily going to be. Around my house, I usually just um, access everything directly by IP address. But keep in mind, NetBIOS and SMB are not synonymous. One's, it's not exactly the same thing here now. Uh, let's see. Oh, for DHCP, if you want to keep your um, box and requesting uh, uh, and you know giving its hosting out to the DCP server and logging that there, you can go in there and edit your dhclient.conf. As best as I can tell, and if my testing and backtrack, this is the case, if you just go ahead and comment out this particular line, you're good to go. Uh, in Windows, I need to do some more testing. I found out various parameters you can set about DHCP service running on Windows, but none of them quite matches that particular attribute when you make your DHCP request. So I haven't quite figured that out. And by the way, if you go in and, you know, I'm not gonna pick on the backtrack for developers because I, I love them dearly. <laughs> but if you, if you go into your um, DHCP logs and you see a bunch of boxes request BT as the host name, go look at those freaking IPs. Just saying. And if you see this guy on your network and you see that in your logs, just, you know, you know who to beat down. <laughs> All right. Uh, advanced IP settings. Let me see. Oh, you can disable NetBIOS over uh, TCP IP underneath your adaptive settings. All right. Uh, also, another topic. DHCP release renew, and I need more information on this. I've noticed on some boxes, like on my Linux boxes, whenever I bring the adapter back up, it will try to reconnect to the same network it was on before. <coughs> well, this might give you a fair amount of information. For instance, let's say they connected at a coffee shop. That's fine for you to hold all information. You've got probably a mat box, probably be a 192.168 number. Might give you a lot of information. But let's say they went from the university, which might have an IP that's unique for every single person who actually uses it, you know, a public internet facing IP address. And then they come to the business to do some kind of attack, and the first IP address they requested was something that was from a university. That greatly reduces the anonymity set and gives you an idea of who to look at. So 
those requests for um, previously used uh, DHCP addresses, the DHCP automatic, those, uh, well, let me see if I'm phrasing this right, so it's uh, automatic uh, renew requests that's uh, sometimes sent out could re uh, reveal information about a person. Like I said, not a whole lot, not build big, big deal for non modables Or if you want to map an IP address to who owns it, I like a lot of the tools at uh, service.sniff.net. Uh, also, of course, the IP they requested, plus the network owner of who owns that IP address, plus the hosting that was uh, stored, plus a little Googling, can pretty quickly uh, lead to an identity. Like, let's say you know a person goes to a certain university, and you know they really like uh, HP Lovecraft because the machine was named Cthulhu. It doesn't take too long to look through the student web pages to figure out which particular student it might be. All right, mitigation. This is going to need a whole lot more research because I'm trying to figure out which OS is requested in which ways. Um, as Carl was mentioning about the Windows world, different clients do things in different odd ways, and I don't really have a good comprehensive list for when they try to request the same IP address again via DHCP and when they don't. So I need to compile that. Did you know the, DHC, the Microsoft DHCP team actually has their own blog? I didn't know that until I started looking into this. So I mean, I'm going to go into some more details. Uh, one way you might be able to do this, in Linux you can pretty much guarantee you can do this, is if you go into a var lib dhcp3, you can go ahead and delete all the dot thesis files, and that probably allows you to take care of it. I haven't tested this in Windows because I haven't been brave enough yet, but if you start deleting the registry keys at that particular location, look in there first uh, to know which ones you're deleting. But inside of that general path seems to be where the least information is stored, so uh, that might be something to look into. Oh, and thanks to uh, Eric Coleman from uh, Satori Project. Who has ever heard of Satori? Satori is essentially a passive OS fingerprinting tool that sits there and listens for certain types of DHCP requests. Because different OSs do a DHCP request slightly different. So based on those requests, you can tell whether it's a Linux box or a Windows box or possibly which version of Windows and whatnot. Uh, Satori has some extra features as well. But uh, I just use Network Miner. Network Miner uses the Satori fingerprints as well as the fingerprints from like Poth and EdoCat and whatnot. And that was the reason I was asking anybody who wants to do the connect to NetCoff, because I was going to go ahead and see if I could identify what OS you were running just from doing passive scans, or passive sniffing. Oh, here's that particular key I was talking about that seems to store my lease information. Which brings up another subject. This lease information, if you happen to be doing forensics and you want to know what else the networks and machines been on, you start go looking in these and look at all the IP addresses the person's had recently. That gives you a, long, a good idea of how well they've been. All right, various other apps that may uh, leak data out there. I was thinking maybe Skype, some kind of IM client, IRC. So I decided to do a quick test. I fired up a uh, Wireshark. Sorry, Ken. I like the pretty gooey. It makes me feel all safe and warm and fuzzy inside. Uh, anyway, uh, I fired it up and fired up Pigeon, because I use Pigeon for most all my IM uh, needs. And I decided to see what else information was going on about me. Well, one thing you'll notice real quick is um, I was connecting to IRC. You actually can see that in that particular line. And we'll drill down to something a little bit more interesting in what I'll show here in a second. Even DNS information shows something about who I'm contacting and what services I'm using. Like if I'm contacting something that says, I don't even know what AOL calls those services, but if I was contacting aim.aol.com, you have a good idea that I'm an AIM user. Uh, if the protocol is unencrypted, there's tons of information, as you'll see here in a second, that will go out. And you don't know what all stuff, what all applications might be going into your box that are doing some kind of phone home activity until you actually put a sniff on and figure it out. Sometimes putting a sniff on something, first of all, it's a great way to learn about networking in general. Second of all, it's a great way to figure out, what's that? Private <laughs> home? Yeah. You know what all information goes out in those packets? No, I think it just has to do with Windows genuine validation type stuff. But That's I'm the point. Sure, I'm sure there's more information <laughs> that we want going on. Yeah, I'm just wondering if someone can figure out how, if it's not encrypted, and someone can figure out how it's obfuscated, that could be really useful for this kind of work as well. But unencrypted, you get tons of information sent out. Um, and uh, for instance, here I, I found a particular packet and say, oh, this is from IRC. Well, let me do a right click in Wireshark and do a follow stream. And do ever. Everybody here has played with Wireshark some, right? Just a little bit. 
fun tool. Um, here, everything in blue is basically stuff that um, you received. I, yeah, that I received. Anything in pink is stuff that I sent. Why it associates me with pink, I don't know. Um, we're not going to go into the details of that. Uh, if I scroll up here, you'd actually see my password I use. But here you see that I was connecting to a freenode.net, the series of IRC servers, and my username was IMD. You can find my password up above. Also, because of the way this particular IRC client works, it automatically tries to use um, your login ID as your I ident. So even though I used the handle IMD as my nick on IRC, it automatically sent out my name, Adrian. Because that happened to be the name, the username of the machine I was logged into under. So on, yeah, that was going to be the username I was logged into on, the, on that machine. But tons of information about me, just specifically that particular connection. Your Mid domain Skynet. Yes, actually. That was on there too. Yeah, there's another example. And so what do you know about me based on Skynet? <laughs> you like start big fan. You like summer going? <laughs> Actually, no, I just want a machine for president. Yeah. That's all. Uh, awareness, obviously, knowing what's actually being sent out there, what applications you're running, that all helps. Don't use those apps if you want to stay low profile, but first you got to know what those apps are leaking. This goes back to why that whole clean room box is just so much of a better idea. Um, sniff to see what's happening. Actually, I generally recommend just occasionally sniffing your boxes. That didn't sound right at all. <laughs> Sniffing a box occasionally just to see what's going on. Like one time I had a box that got compromised. And anybody who says they've never had one of the boxes hat, either you're very, very good or you're very, very bad and you just don't know that you got hat. Or you just haven't been doing it very long. But one box I was sitting there sniffing, and I don't remember the name of the particular uh, backdoor they put on it, but I noticed lead speak leaving my machine. And I hate lead speak. I mean, I really, really hate lead speak. Not quite as bad as I like hate texting speed, but still. So once I saw that leaving my box, I instantly knew something was up. So I highly recommend sniffing. Now, a related thing I'd like to look into is um, VPN follow homes. I think this might be an interesting thing to pull off and correlate data on at a, a, a larger hacker con like DEF CON. Who here is using a VPN right now? You are. Anybody else? Anybody who, who here ever used a VPN while at a hacker con or a security conference? I don't believe you all. I do. Okay. <laughs> Let's say someone did something like this. This might be kind of interesting to do. VPN follow home. What you do is basically you find out the name of the person's machine. Like there's a machine called uh, Adrian-PC. Well, I guess it might be me. Or if it was Adrian Crenshaw, you definitely know it's me. You follow traffic from there, even though it's encrypted, it's contacting a certain IP on the internet. Based on who owns that IP address, you may have found my home VPN service I'm going into, so you know my home IP address then, or maybe at least the company I'm working for. All of this can be useful information. So I think it might be kind of cool just to come up with a tool that somewhat automates the whole you know, VPN follow home idea. Go to a hackathon, see what machine names come up, and see who you can trace back to where they actually work via what VPN they connect to. I thought that'd be nifty. That might be a future project for me to uh, fire up in uh, Python, because I'm learning Python now, and do that, and uh, use some of the uh, the PCAP libraries and see what I can uh, pull up. Oh, another thing I need to do some more look into is uh, Universal Plug and Play and Bonjour. Uh, basically, things that automatically help configure your network and peripherals. Anything that's automatic, I have kind of a little bit of a distrust for. See what all information is given out about that by those particular things. Um, phone home addresses, various things your machine might automatically <coughs> contact. For instance, uh, let's say before you put your machine to sleep, you had a bunch of uh, file shares open. You have machine, bring the machine back out of sleep on an entirely different network with all the stuff it requests. That might be informative. And so much more. Like I said, this subject matter is wide open for finding out more things. This is by no means a comprehensive talk. And this is something I kind of came up with because I was also working on uh, the NetCoff game we'll be running to get tomorrow, me and Martin. Uh, hopefully, some of y'all will come out and play that. But um, this whole topic of subject matter I think needs a lot more research. I got to thank uh, Dancing Dan, uh, Bill Swenson, Jim Halfpenny, and Michael Dickey from Paul.com mailing list for giving me a few suggestions on things I should add to this presentation. Uh, a little bit about that clean room PC idea. Simply stated, an attacker should use the same box that they uh, use for like normal day-to-day -day activities for the attack. That way, there's less 
personal data that could possibly be leaked. Uh, part of the box as best as possible, using some of the tips that have been given, though this, like I said, this presentation can no way, in no way be comprehensive. Uh, clean room PC is probably going to be better than a, a, a clean room boot partition, and both of those will still be better than like a clean room VM. Um, and, but still, all of those would be better probably than do, doing the uh, testing from uh, your normal default profile that you do your average web surfing and day-to-day -day activities on. And uh, so make yourself a dual boot system. A few great <coughs> tools to play around with. Wireshark, if you want to see what tools are actually doing, use Wireshark. Or if you want to, TCP dump's cool too. Actually, I really like TCP dump from the standpoint of dumping tons and tons of uh, data to a PCAT file and then importing it into something else. It's one of my favorite things to do with it. Uh, Network Miner is an awesome tool, which I'll show here in a second, for doing passive OS fingerprinting. And I hope some more people have uh, connected to NetCoff and you know, sent a little data out there. Uh, Backtrack Linux, of course. Uh, yeah, Backtrack Linux. Uh, pretty much any security tool you want to use, or at least a large majority of them, if they can figure out how to get them to work, it's pretty much on there. And uh, a few events I wanted to uh, tell people about. DerbyCon 2011, which is coming up in a little less than a year. It's organized by Dave, Martin, and myself. Hopefully that comes up real well. Um, Louisville InfoSec happens every year, usually in October. And various cons I highly recommend going to. SkyDogCon, even though it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> HackerCon, since I'm here right now. Come next year. Uh, Freaknik because I go there every year. Not a con, and of course, out of zone down in Atlanta. Don't know how far a trip it is for some of you, but I always have a good time in out of zone. All right, finally, any questions? Not yes. really a question, but I linked to some stuff off your website that was showing, like, in Windows 7, there's XML files being stored anytime you connect to a Wi-Fi spot, and uh, it actually stores the key in that, there's yep. some way to crack it or something. Yeah, well, yeah, if you use a wireless key view from the yeah. you have local machine access, you can plug that off. Yeah. So that stuff was pretty cool. Nearsoft has like a ton of cool Yeah, Nia has a ton of interesting little tools. And oh, we bring up Network Miner again. I love Network Miner for the information it'll give you. Uh, no one's actually sent me enough data to really have this be interesting. But, um, oh, apparently they have. <laughs> All right, here's a ton of information. Passaway is actually did a little bit of OS fingerprinting on a few of these boxes. This is a Solaris box. I'm having doubt of that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, notice how the host name is BT? Probably a backtrack box. Yep. Yeah, Was that? I really don't know. Well, let's take a look. It's the IP address. Uh, uh, 10 0, 0, 1, 10. That's my VM. Oh, it's your VM? I wonder why it's a Solaris. That's odd. <laughs> Did you modify anything about the way your IP stack works? Yeah, no. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both EDCAP, see, basically, uh, Nicholas Miner combines a bunch of different tools. Uh, I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, but he developed this tool and uh, go out there and play with it. But it includes the passive OS fingerprinting tools from a bunch of other um, uh, tools like EDCAP, POS, and Satori. It, based on Satori, it thinks it's Linux because it sees this particular bit of information. And there's something called a window ID that gets passed in some DCP requests, and you'll quickly know what OS it is based on that. But this is what, you know, Miles is going to figure out the, this particular machine just by passively listening. So, actually, one of the ways if you want to figure out doing OS fingerprint of like a web server or about scanning or something like Nmap, just visit it a few times while running Network Miner or PAWF or one of these other tools and passively fingerprint it. Not that most people don't change their header, so you can probably just look at the header and know. Uh, let's go look at this uh, box. This is one Windows box. See what information we have on that. Why does it think it's this particular type of OS? Let's go take a look. Uh, EDOCAP profiled it as a Windows 2000 box. That's probably because EDOCAP hasn't been updated in quite a while, so does its fingerprints haven't been updated. Satori thinks it's a DHCP, via DHCP request, that it's a Windows XP box. See, there's a string, I think it's something like MSFT. 5.0 that gets passed as the window ID. And by the way, if anybody can figure out a way to change that in Windows, let me know. I asked that question on like Oddball, just to test on Oddball, and I had a lot of people answer the question, but they didn't know what I was asking, so it didn't get me anywhere. 
But if anybody can figure out how to change that window ID for DHCP requests in Windows, let me know. And various other boxes, like here's one that actually did identify as a Linux box. And, uh, hey, I'm just interested. I connected with my phone. I'm just interested if it says what it says. Okay. Uh, I may have to need your IP just in case it doesn't always fingerprint it properly. Who's, oh, the Blackberry? Oh, there it is. Who's the Blackberry? Uh, BT Solaris, BT Other. There's two people using Backtrack, it looks like. Uh, some Android phone. Ah, uh, that's it. They plucked out the name. So it's, no, it's an Android user. What else? Sam's show? iPhone. So it doesn't give you any more information? Not a whole lot. It may not be any of its fingerprint databases, and you may need to send more traffic. Uh, you may take a little bit of traffic before you can identify it. Uh, host details. Oh, what's in here? The vendor code it sent out was DHCPCD 4.0.15. But the nice thing about uh, Network Miner also, I'm going to close Network Miner down, is it automatically dumps a PCAP file for you. Let me see if I can go find this. While it's doing all its capturing, it's got a little PCAP file right here. And I can then analyze it for more details inside of Wireshark. Or I can load it into Kane to extract passwords. Although Network Miner does extract some passwords. Another cool thing about Network Miner I love is it, it can um, watch FTP, HTTP streams, and uh, SMB streams and pluck files out of them. So if I'm running this on the gateway, or if I'm doing a man in the middle attack and sniffing the connection, if you're using any of those three protocols, I can start dumping files to my hard drive and start looking at them. Images, Word docs, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's really nifty for that. But uh, yeah, there's this, um, here's just some of the data in that PCAP file that uh, no, it might have generated for me. So now I just loaded in some other tool if I want to find out other information. That's pretty much all I have for my presentation. Is there no other questions? All right, then. Thanks very much for your time. Oh. Is your PowerPoint available for download? Not yet, but it will be shortly. Sometime early next week when I put up all the other videos from this conference, it'll be out there. Okay, thanks. No problem. That script's in your email box. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm looking forward to playing with that. It's, 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 just a, it's a bash script with my chef. Script? As far as I'm concerned, lots of there's no real copyright on it. No, it, you can get it off the web. Uh, All right. The web link is about close as I can get. Squatthis.net. Squatthis.net. Slash papers. Slash papers. And then where is ap.sh? Where is ap.sh? Neat. I'll try that out. Thank you very much. Bash script, Shadow Page, you wrote. Oh. What you do is you run the script with the MAC address, and if it returns geo coordinates, you take the longitude and latitude, cut and paste those into Google Maps, and it will show you. Nifty. Works. What comes after where is? Where is AP? Access point. Not that. Cool. Well, I thank you all for your time, and I want to let the next speaker get themselves up here. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stop this stuff first.